Very simple. So some financial planning is very simple like that. Other financial planning can get really complex. So I've been writing all this past year about Roth segregation accounts and how you can do five times the Roth conversion you really want to do, wait a year and a half, and then decide which ones that you want to keep. And of all the ones, maybe one of them has done the best and you just keep that one and then you move on. So that's a very complex technique. That also makes you about 30% more than just doing a straight Roth conversion. So there is some advantage to that. Um, and there's complex techniques like that as well. So wealth management is the principle. Very small changes have a huge effect on your finances. As to just an example, if you save $10 a day, you'll retire a millionaire for every $10 a day you save and invest. So it's very simple like that. And the younger you do it is better. So if you have kids or grandkids and they, they're looking for financial advice, save and invest now and you will be able to live very well later. It's, it's that deferred... Uh, the deferred consumption, which in economics is the definition of capital. Capital is just deferring your consumption, having the money to put to work. It's not just savings. A lot of people save. And what do they have? They have uh, less valuable inflation uh, uh, dollars uh, when they go forward. You have to save and invest. Only investing will make on average about 6.5% over inflation. And you know it never makes six. It never makes six and a half. I mean, six and a half percent over inflation in the markets is uh, about ten to twelve percent on average. The markets make ten to twelve percent. But if you look at the last seventy years, do you know how many years the markets came in between ten and twelve percent? It's three. <laughs> Typically, what they do is they do twenty percent, twenty percent, twenty percent, negative ten. That's about one standard deviation. But more typically, they do 30%, negative 50, and they're all over the maps like that. But on average, they do very well. So last year was a good year. The US markets were up 15%. Um, other markets were actually up more than that. So 15% was sort of a good baseline for what the markets would do. Last year was a very good year in the markets. So if you want a financial tip, rebalance your portfolio. Because the markets are up right now. I noticed the Dow was up 100 today. I would expect sometime we're going to have a correction in the markets, but, and it might be significant. So if you rebalance your portfolio now, you'll take some of that profit off the table and put it into stability. And then if the markets do have a correction, you'll take some of that stability and put it back into the markets. So you'll be selling high and buying low, which is, of course, the definition of good investing. So, so now is a good time to rebalance. The markets they were announcing today on CNBC have just hit an all, you know, they're at a two-year high. Anytime the markets are making news, two-year high, six-month low, that's an excellent time to rebalance. And rebalancing, if the markets continue to, do, to go up, you'll still do very well. But if the markets have a correction, then you've, you've prepared yourself for it and you've taken some of that off of the table. Okay, the difference between, retiring, between very small financial effects could be the, retif the difference between, this is the, from the game of life, going to countryside acres or to millionaire estates. And it's that much of a difference for very small changes. Um, I have some clients who have never had a lot of income, but they are very, very frugal super savers, and they have two and a half, three million dollars saved up. And so it's not your income that matters, it's your saving habits and your lifestyle habits that matter. Because wealth isn't what you spend, wealth is what you save. So that's the difference between the millionaire next door and the person who may be living like a millionaire and has no assets to their name. There's a very big difference between those two. Okay, comprehensive wealth management involves a lot of different components. And, and these are the icons that we like to use for all the different sort of aspects of, of financial planning. I only put two dozen up there. There's, there's closer to four dozen. But these are the sort of the main ones that we uh, end up using. Um, and the one I'd like to focus on in first today is the one that we call life planning, which means what is all the money for? What are you actually trying to do? So it's interesting to note um, life planning, if you think about it, um, life planning is, um, it, it, here's the way we think about it. A lot of those icons, if you will, and a lot of those topics fall into investment management. And investment management is at the core of what we do, and, and it's what people think of when they think of, of 
investment people and people that are in finance. So investment management is, is all the techniques about rebalancing and asset allocation and, and what you're trying to invest in and getting the lowest expense ratios. And there's a lot of wisdom in that area. And it's certainly at the core because it's the engine that's driving that 6.5% over inflation every single year, or at least on average over every five or 10 year period. But around investment management is another ring, if you will, financial planning. So this is, am I saving enough in order to, um, to actually reach my goals? Or if I'm retired, how much can I take out and live on? College planning, I, I want to know that my kids will have enough to go to college. Uh, I need to save up for a new car, and so how's that going to work? I'm saving up for a house, and how is that going to work? It's all the kinds of projections and planning. And in financial planning circles, what you're looking for is an 80% probability that you'll meet your goals. You never have 100% probability. You're looking for 80%. If you try to have 100% probability, you will never spend a dime because that's the best way of knowing you'll have enough money. And of course, that's not the lifestyle you want to have. So the right lifestyle is found somewhere in about 80% probability of meeting your goals. You're living as well as you can and still having some assurity of meeting your goals. So financial planning, that's sort of the principles behind financial planning. Now, some people either have so much money or are so frugal in their spending that you know you're going to meet your goals. And there's another ring uh, that's, that's important then, and that is wealth management. So wealth management is you have all this wealth. What do I do with it, and how do I be a good steward of it? And so this involves everything from... Um, charitable giving and philanthropy of, of, of what you're trying to, of the, so the causes you're trying to support, to generational financial planning. How do you make sure that your kids and your grandkids are not just getting your wealth, that's easy to do, but getting your values as well and bringing them along so that they understand how to handle money, how to be charitable, how to, all the different things you're trying to teach people. Um, and then also estate planning because, you know, the estate planning limit was, it went away last year, then it was going to drop down to a million. Now it's five million for two years. The rules continually change and uh, changing complex rules is what CPAs and estate planning attorneys make their living off of. So, you know, if you didn't die last year, this year's a good year. <laughs> Um, you know, 2012, which is supposed to be, you know, is still a good year, so long as the world ends in the fall of 2012 and it doesn't linger on until the spring of 2013. So, so we, you know, you've got all these things you're trying to figure out. And, it, you know, a lot of people have very simple estate plans. I'm leaving all the money to my kids and stuff like that. Some people have very complex estate plans because they're trying to put some safeguards in place. So I want to make sure if my, uh, my child's marriage fails that that they still have this money. And there are certain kinds of trusts that you can put the money in so that it protects it from creditors and failed marriages and things like that. You can also protect the money from the child, meaning this child is not going to handle this money well. And so I am going to put safeguards so that this money is gradually doled out over their lifetime and they can't blow it all in one year, but it will, it, they, get, they get a second chance every year to spend or blow that year's, um, that year's amount. Or, for example, you can put it in your estate plan to be able to, um, you get this much money, then so long as you complete college, you get this much money, and so long as you complete graduate school, you get this much money. And, and so there's, there's sort of uh, values associated with how you spend your money and, and where it goes and how it's handled. So there's a lot in wealth management because you're trying to do good things with your wealth, and good things is very much dependent upon uh, what values and what you're trying to accomplish. And a good estate planning attorney can write anything into an estate plan. So um, a lot of people have a boilerplate, but then a lot of people are smart enough to ask the question, what are you trying to accomplish and how do we do that? A lot of people think they need to treat all of their children equally. Somehow that's fair. Um, you, when you were a parent, you never treated all of your children equally. There were some you trusted and some you didn't trust. You know, some who were good to their word and good with money and some who were not good to their word and, and, and are not good with money. And so you don't have to treat them all the same in an estate plan. That's just an, a recognition that loving one child is different than loving another child because they're different people. So wealth management is a whole other ring.